Okay, thank you, Andrea. I really appreciate the wonderful introduction. And it's really exciting to be at this real great conference. I mean, boy, you know, you hear one talk and you say, wow, that was worth the whole thing. And then the next talk, again, it's worth the whole thing. So it's been a compounding of really nice, clear, and insightful science uh, that's been presented. So thank you to all the speakers, too. Um, I want to share with you some exciting uh, research and some new findings that are coming out in the field of exercise and AD research, and particularly on the impact of healthy lifestyles. And um, in, in, this, in this area of working on Alzheimer's, our goal is to promote successful aging, delay onset, and treat uh, Alzheimer's disease. It turns out that there hasn't really been a successful pharmaceutical, new pharmaceutical for Alzheimer's disease since the 90s. And, you know, but, <clears throat> which is disappointing, but on the other hand, there's been great progress in the area of lifestyle research to show that that is having a great impact on health of older people and the ability to maintain, quote, life in the years. And um, so it turned out that physical inactivity is really the number one modifiable risk factor. And um, this kind of, you know, I have to say when I first saw this, I said, wow, number one, that's impressive. And, you know, I <clears throat> read the paper and happened to know both of these uh, authors and I've had a chance to talk to them. And they put together a good case. Now, they didn't include diet in the analysis, which I'm sure is a big factor. And they didn't look at combined treatments, which is probably even a more powerful factor. But nonetheless, it just indicates that there's something right about this approach. And we need more clinical work to really you know, nail it down. Um, and I'll be talking about the new clinical trial uh, coming up that UCI is going to uh, participate in. It's, it's basically, you know, in, in some of these popular magazines that I read, like the Mayo Clinic newsletter, but that's not exactly what you'd call a popular magazine, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> For me it is, but you know, anyway. And so they had this really nice little phrase called sitting is the new smoking. And that kind of embodies it, but you know, look what we did to essentially stop and slow down the, the consumption of cigarettes and, cig and create cigarette smoke. And if we could just do the same thing for getting more activity in older people, we'd have a big impact and probably just as big, if not bigger, than smoking. So the outline I will go through is to talk about age and synapses, um, how exercises increases uh, brain drive neurotrophic factor, which is fundamentally almost a, what you'd have to call a miracle molecule. And then I'll talk about clinical studies on physical activity and cognition, and then go to a concept that exercise actually induces a molecular memory for the benefits of exercise, so that you can sort of rebring that memory back up more easily. And then I'll talk about the amount and type of exercise and one of the controversies that uh, has come out recently because, you know, there's always got to be something for scientists to disagree about. I mean, it's in their nature, I guess. And then I'll talk about regulation of genes in the human brain with physical activity, kind of a really novel, out there approach. Okay. Um, the brain in, is um, basically structured into discrete areas, all of which serve different functions. They have to work as partners. And they're the, the workhorses in the whole system um, are the neurons that are supported by the glial cells, the vascular system, this lymphatic system that we were hearing about. And all, all this has to work together. Now, um, so the synapses that the neurons make to connect is basically the key element in, in brain function. It turns out that as insidious as it is, um, Alzheimer's disease attacks the synapses. And it, it basically, you could say, it's almost a disease of synaptic failure. And this was coined very appropriately by um, a great scientist, Anaselko, 
and it kind of embodies a thing that's been uh, continuing in the field since its original description by Bob Terry in 89 and by uh, synaptic plasticity being uh, compromised by uh, amyloid and oligomers and just being deficient in, um, in studies on uh, synaptic plasticity by Bill Klein and many, many people. There's been hundreds of papers now showing that synaptic plasticity and synaptic function is compromised. Um, <clears throat> the a dramatic illustration of showing how synapses get attacked by brain pathology is in this because the, um, the vehicle tra treated cells are neurons that are growing in culture. And then if you add a little bit of uh, amyloid, uh, A-beta-42, it basically binds to the synapses and causes them to dysfunction. And so and it targets the synapse. And boy, look how specific that is. All those little dots are synapses with amyloid in them, uh, <clears throat> and binding to the cell surface and causing their own aberrant signaling and synaptic dysfunction. The key molecule for keeping the brain healthy is BDNF. <clears throat> it's a growth factor or a trophic factor. And what BDNF is, does is it's produced primarily by neurons and it signals between neurons along with neurotransmitters, and it's basically released, and then it's transported from one part of the, as it's released, it's picked up by another cell and actually transported retrogradely from the dendrites back to the soma, and then has a whole series of transformations that it can cause in gene expression patterns and promoting the health of the brain, of the neuron, of the brain. And so and it's, Turns out that it's not just um, present with activity, it, but it's driven by activity, which is really pretty cool because the neurons by firing are actually keeping themselves healthier. My gosh, you know, what a, what a remarkable system to take care of itself. And you think about it, neurons have to live for a lifetime. 122 is probably their record because that's the oldest person, but to keep something out of the garage and working properly for 122 years has not yet been achieved, at least not in my car. <laughs> and I don't think in anybody else's either yet. Maybe Tesla will do it, but not quite yet. Okay, <clears throat> so what brain drive neurotrophic factor does is it promotes neuron health survival and protects neurons from toxins, it stimulates synaptic function and plasticity, and it's essentially needed for this uh, synaptic analog of learning called long-term potentiation, which is actually a synaptic molecule uh, that occurs at the synapse, or synaptic change, that's an underlying mechanism believed to be fundamental for memory. And what you do is you give this, the neuron some, a little bit of test stimulation, you then train it a little bit with another set of pulses, and then you go back again and retest it, and it remembers the fact that it had been stimulated, so that that's, a, that's basically synaptic memory. And that whole system of how it occurs has been worked out at a, at a molecular level with great detail, and BDNF, or brain drive neurotrophic factor, turns out to be pivotal in that. And so the problem is, you'd say, well, you know, where, where, where can I buy some? Well, the problem is it's a protein, and so it gets degraded along with all, the, all other proteins, and so it cannot be given peripherally. And infusing it in the brain isn't even feasible if it could be done neurosurgically because it doesn't diffuse very far, and it gets degraded by the extracellular enzymes. So how can BDNF be increased in the brain? Well, that kind of puzzled me, and I thought that was a big challenge. So I said, well, you know, I'd been wondering about this observation that, that it seemed to be that people that were active seemed to be aging less rapidly. There was a study of the MacArthur Foundation uh, that was published that showed that uh, <clears throat> basically physical activity was associated with a slower rate of cognitive decline. And I said, wow, 
And this, the only thing they were looking at was more gardening and more a little occasional work, et cetera, et cetera. But what a striking finding. And I said, what the heck is that due to? And I looked in the literature and I found two or three papers on what exercise does to the brain. It was basically increased metabolism, which you know isn't any big surprise. So I started asking myself, well, what might it be doing? And at that time, you know, the molecule that was the sort of miracle uh, molecule was BDNF. And it was up and coming on the scene. And so I said, wouldn't it be cool if BDNF was induced by exercise? And so I proposed this to one of my best postdocs. And he looked at me and decided that I'd lost it this time for sure. And that, you know, yeah, 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 Carl, I'll think about it. And then I try to, one of my best graduate students, and they, yeah, 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 I won't think about it. And so then I, I went to my first year graduate student that actually had an uh, uh, undergraduate degree in, in, in physical therapy and, and uh, physical activity. And she said, oh, that's interesting, I'll try that. So that was the start of it. And then all the postdocs and graduate students wanted to work on it once it worked. <laughs> so, so here's what happens when you, uh, when uh, animal exercises, BDNF levels go up. They go up primarily in the hippocampus, which is the targeted area for uh, pathology and Alzheimer's disease. And um, so it was, uh, it's pretty amazing that as a function of physical activity and even to a degree the dose curve is increased by physical activity, but it does eventually go down if there's too much activity. So the marathon runner is probably not, not doesn't keep going up and up and up. Uh, there's also a threshold, and I'll come back to that threshold when we talk about how much um, activity is probably necessary. So <clears throat> let's go into then physical activity and clinical trials and what's the status. So uh, there's been a, uh, one of the better papers that sort of started this whole area of clinical trials in uh, physical activity. It was a study by Weave and co-workers uh, from Harvard. And what they did is they studied a series of nurses that they thought would, be, would, would fill out the forms and give accurate answers. <laughs> I mean, if they'd have asked professors, forget it. <laughs> it's not going to happen, or ask most people that forget it. But this was great wisdom, and they, they tested the reliability of the information survey uh, by phone and in person, and they basically were in agreement. So they collected the data, and then they, t they categorized how much activity uh, was being done and how did that affect cognitive function. And what you can see here is that low levels, um, and you really don't, that's, that's pretty much um, <clears throat> not a big effect. And then it increases uh, exponentially, per, virtually, at the very high levels of activity. And if you look at that, uh, those yellow uh, boxes, you can see running and stair climbing is, very, is at the highest level for if it's performed one hour a day, or one, one hour yeah, per day. And um, or for one hour period. And then moderate is, would be aerobic aesthetic, calisthenics and brisk walking. And then light, uh, which doesn't even come, is below the, the threshold, is, is like just, um, um, just a light stroll. So a light stroll, at least for one hour, doesn't have much impact. Now, it, it could be that if you went for you know, five, six hours, then that would have an impact because this stuff does accumulate and it would be more exertion. Okay. Um, so <clears throat> there was another study. So that was, that was sort of survey. And the first real clinical trial that got published was um, one carried out by a Lanschlager and colleagues. It came out in uh, JAMA. And it was basically people with a subjective complaint of memory problems. They were assigned to home-based physical intervention or usual care. And uh, they had an average increase in physical activity of about um, you know, 110 minutes per week, or very, very little, actually. And that significantly approved a global measure 
for cognitive function called the ADES COG, which is a classic marker endpoint for clinical trials. And so that was really remarkable that physical activity would do as well. Um, some of the anticholinesterases and some of the drugs like Amenda and so on uh, don't hit any better in improving ADAS COG. In fact, some of them are even a little lower. So, okay. And then the other study that came in a couple of years afterwards is by a good friend and colleague uh, of mine, Laura Baker, who studied people with MCI and uh, you know, mild cognitive impairment and used an aerobic exercise intervention of three times per week at 45 minutes for 60 to 80 percent of heart rate reserve for six months. And that improved executive function outcomes, which we've heard about repeatedly in previous talks, and also biomarkers such as glucose utilization. So they were basically, their body chemistry was healthier. Um, <clears throat> and <clears throat> You know, there have been several trials, and I'll, I'll bring you some new data from Baker um, later on in the talk to update what's been done, you know, just recently and reported at the International Alzheimer's meeting for the first time. So <clears throat> one of the issues, though, is that, you know, regular exercise is pretty hard to do. And I kind of got, you know, concerned about this because you know, sometimes I'm on an airplane, you know, for uh, the weekend, and then I'm coming back and, you know, I'm sitting in a meeting and then coming back in an airplane, and I'm feeling, you know, <laughs> you know it's getting, getting a little jittery and well, worrying about whether some of the exercise effects that I hopefully been getting were going to stay around. And I know people worry about this if they get sick or they can't exercise for a while, geez, do I, have I lost all that and should I just give up? Because I worked pretty hard for this. So we essentially decided to do an experiment and test the assumption in the rodents where we could actually control uh, rigorously the, uh, the amount and duration and intervals of exercise. And what we found is that <clears throat> versus sedentary uh, animals, the BDNF levels, if you set that at 100%, and then you come in with uh, essentially uh, two days of exercise. You can get uh, essentially no effect that's not enough exercise. Um, and then if you exercise for two weeks, that's fine. But, and then it decays down again in two weeks. And then if you leave them rest for um, one week, can you bring it back again? How many think it'll come back? How many? Don't think it'll come back. And how many here don't care, actually? No. <laughs> so it, it basically, it comes back. So you don't need two days anymore. It comes back immediately with two days, instantly. So there's, we think there's a molecular memory for the benefits of exercise on BDNF and other pathways that we've studied. And it's a, it's a very exciting thing to think that the nervous system has such an interesting and valuable mechanism to keep stored the benefits of something that's good for the person and the brain. And um, we actually just got uh, a grant reviewed on this topic and we'll be doing some more work exactly at this. Okay, so BDNF can be rapidly reduced by just a little bit of exercise and restore uh, the benefits uh, of exercise. Okay, at this juncture then, you know, things were looking pretty good and the importance of exercise seemed non-controversial. In fact, you know, I was, if I'd give a talk, people would say, oh, exercise, we know that that's good for you. You know, so what's new? Um, well, it's not that simple. Science doesn't stay quiet for very long. And um, there was a study called the LIFE study, which came out uh, in just 2015, about two months ago. And what it found is that uh, for uh, 1,600 people that were physically frail, cognitively normal, and were on 24 months of, of light to moderate exercise, um, 
It can improve cognitive, it can improve physical function, that is, they become less frail. But um, did it improve cognition? And this was a, let me emphasize, this was a, a light to moderate physical activity, a 30 minutes of walking, plus very light resistance training, maybe two, three pounds of weights or such. And <clears throat> then versus health education as a control, so there's no inactivity or anything, it was just health education. And then they measured several cognitive outcomes, uh, DigiSymbol and List Learning. And so what they found is there was no benefit of physical activity and intervention. Exercise uh, um, dose was actually sufficient to improve physical function and reduce frailty, but not cognition. Now, what, why is that? Because didn't you just tell me there are all these studies that um, you know, showed improvements? Well, I think there's an explanation of this. And that's that the dose of exercise was too low uh, in terms of intensity and duration to actually register uh, at the level of light to moderate, you know, with only a, a couple hours a week. And so <clears throat> um, that looks okay, but then when I was preparing this presentation, I was showing it to Nicole Birchoff, who I put on the, uh, as an author on the paper, uh, the abstract, that this is actually quite consistent with the Weave study, which I showed you previously, about the levels of activity and, the, and you know, how much improvement you got on cognition. And what the Weave study showed is that 90 minutes of moderate walking uh, only gives you 5.2 hours of activity, which is the lowest quintile in the Weave study, and it gave you the lowest benefits on cognition. So it wasn't sufficient to, probably it was in the low levels that it wasn't sufficient to bolster it. So what's, what's currently um, being investigated is the effects of higher doses of exercise, and that's the Weave study, as you see here, we're down to the the, down below at this level, and we need to be up around these levels. Okay, so more recent results, however, have been really converged on the idea that aerobic exercise is robust and will affect many measures of brain health. And so <clears throat> uh, Laura Baker has just uh, completed a study of aerobic exercise effects on cognition, blood flow, and CSF and AD biomarkers in adults with mild cognitive impairment. These are reasonably mild cognitive impairment, not yet in meeting the diagnosis of Alzheimer's disease. The study design is essentially six months of aerobic activity versus stretching. Um, and you know, then they do uh, a series of tests, take uh, a CSF sample, and then look at brain volume and blood flow, and then do a cognitive evaluation along with biomarkers. Well, one of the hallmarks in, in basically the onset of AD pathology that's been talked about here and is really a, a key uh, pathology measure is the accumulation of tangles and uh, phosphorylated tau. And so what happens to tau with the exercise? And so this was a breakthrough finding. Essentially, the aerobic activity actually reduced the amount of phosphorylated tau in the CSF. So what that's telling you is that aerobic activity is reducing the rate of patholo brain pathology, not just improving cognition, but actually going to the fundamental level and reducing the accumulation of pathology. And that's a basically pivotal finding and needs to be extended and repeated. And in addition to that, uh, it increases cerebral blood flow. The, the relative to stretching, there is essentially more, more robust blood flow. So I don't know whether it's the stiffening of the vessels is a little easier, there's growth of new vessels or whatever, but the net effect is that there's better blood flow, which is essentially, uh, again, good news. 
because you have to get the nutrients and the exchange of materials in and out of the brain. And what that amounts to is that it's, it's basically both in the right and left side, and it's in multiple regions. So that's very encouraging. It also has an impact <clears throat> on executive function, tasks, um, you know, basically a series of tests that uh, look at the frontal lobe and uh, executive function, which is basically involved in decision making, uh, changing your life course, setting your goals, and essentially other sub areas like reaction time and essentially working memory, et cetera. So <clears throat> that's pretty exciting. Uh, the data on uh, other list learning tests and so on is still under analysis and Laura doesn't have that uh, completed data set yet. But <clears throat> while that's ongoing, okay, we need to understand the fundamental way exercise improves brain health and cognitive function. And um, let's shift to the molecular level and uh, identify possible mechanisms. Okay, <clears throat> so what is the effect of uh, physical activity at the gene level on the brain? And so how do we, how do synaptic gene expression change with age in the human brain? Well, we know on postmortem tissues that basically it's downhill. And so the, the synaptic genes go decrease and this is not good because there's just, even without dementia, you're losing some synaptic connections. So what can we do? And we'll exercise cognitive stimulation and social stimulation and or basically bring those synaptic losses back again and keep the brain at a functional level, synaptically strongly connected and able to learn. So <clears throat> this was a dream of being able to do this. And so I was talking to a colleague of mine, David Bennett, at Rush um, Medical Center. And I said, David, I'm kind of interested in getting maybe some of your postmortem tissues because you've got good characterization. But do you have anything on physical activity and what else they do? And he says, oh, that's really interesting. I just happen to have a tigraphy which basically tracks their total activity on some of these people. I said, really? Wow, we need to talk about this and, and, and work some collaboration out so we can look at some of the fundamental gene changes. And so we set up a, a, a collaboration and I'm gonna show you some of the first data that's come out of that, which we haven't even published yet, but it's submitted. And um, these people also were assessed for cognitive function, social activity, cognitive frequency, and physical activity besides you know, tigraphy. So <clears throat> what we did then is to use gene arrays to look at and survey the genes available. And um, you know, then we could compare and see which measure of physical, social, or cognitive activity has the greatest impact on gene expression. Cognitive, social, physical are all about equal. How many think that they're all gonna be equal? How many think that cognitive stimulation will win? How many don't wanna commit? <laughs> okay. Well, the data came out much to my surprise and Nicole's uh, surprise, and it turns out that physical activity drives hippocampal gene expression to a greater degree than cognitive or social stimulation. And so that was really basically a big surprise and you know, kind of a, a, a cornerstone for the, the idea of how these lifestyles can impact the brain. Now I'll tell you in a minute that I think these things do interact and that once the synapsic expression is higher, that it enables greater cognitive activity and, and stimulation and greater social activity. So it's enabling. It basically, it makes the brain more ready to interact and play back and forth with the environment to, to gain a reciprocal benefit pattern. Okay, 
So <clears throat> um, just mentioned that uh, this, this rate of physical activity was inversely related to cognitive decline. And um, look at um, which areas of synaptic function. I won't go into much of this. But basically, what I'll say is that physical activity globally reprograms synaptic function for the transmitter release, for modulators are upregulated, uh, postsynaptic machinery is upregulated where the transmitters interact, and the synapses are stabilized and growing. And so it's, it's across the board benefits, which means the synapses are no doubt stronger and more youthful in their function. And this is just an example of some of the data, but I'll skip that because I'm going to be short on time. So thus physical activity can counteract age-related decline in gene expression. Well, what about um, can it offset some of the AD-related trends and change in gene expression? And the bottom line is, yes, it also can do that. And so you're not only reducing the age-related effects, but you're also doing the AD-related effects and pushing them back again to where they are more normal instead of on the track to Alzheimer's disease. And that was kind of a pretty big surprise because you know, you're reversing some of the clock on this. And that's examples of it. So the conclusion from these uh, gene array studies is that it globally enhances synaptic machinery, makes the brain more ready to encode and learn. Uh, basically, a prepared brain is a healthy and active brain. The net result is that individuals can benefit more from cognitive and social activity because the synapses are stronger and more ready. It's basically like having your car warmed up and all ready to go, uh, and so then it performs better, and you gain, you know, essentially uh, stronger, better driving and, and ease of uh, navigation through um, the road map of, of life, if you will. Okay, so now I want to, the last part, a minute or so, talk to you about a um, study that we're going to be participating in at UCI that's led by Laura Baker and I to look at um, a, um, exercise in people with mild cognitive impairment. And we're gonna basically be doing a one-year intervention for four times, three to four times per week, 45 minutes per session, and these will be gradually worked, uh, ramped up, and the activities will be carried out at local Ys, so there'll be kind of a social interaction where the local Ys are actually gonna manage the actual intervention, which will be great because then we're gonna get it into the community and translate the findings, and um, the people will be encouraged to enroll with a, with a friend, so it's gonna have some kind of social stimulation in it, and um, we'll try and perform the activities in a group. So this is going to launch in early 2016. We would actually be launched already, except we got into a couple snags with all of the fooling around in universities and government administrations. Uh, the thing was funded four years ago, actually, and so it's taken a little while, but it's now ready to roll and we'll be done and we're gonna uh, roll. So if, you're, if, any, if you know anybody or are interested in it, uh, we'll be taking and enrolling people in it and you can contact Beatrice Inez or Vanessa Lynn uh, at the clinic numbers and uh, those are listed there or email them and they'll get back to you. So this will be a really exciting opportunity. And basically we're just confirming the studies and extending them that has already been published on smaller groups of people. And our goal is to do a definitive study that will then allow a physician to have definitive proof that exercise is good for people and they can write a prescription on a pad of paper and it would be done. A whole different game. So this is our effort at translation, plus we'll have the Y system to facilitate it. We think other fitness centers will probably come online so we're trying to get both the documentation, the encouragement, and also the mechanism to take it forward. Okay, so the conclusions are that exercise and good physical activity can add more life to years. 
Animal studies and clinical trials demonstrate the benefits of exercise, and exercise needs to be aerobic, um, and it can be intermittent, though, and tap into molecular memory mechanisms, and it builds synapses in the human brain and fights off synaptic failure. Well, nothing's new. Hippocrates, the father of uh, modern medicine, already said this. Uh, if we could give every individual the right amount of nourishment and exercise, we would have found the safest way to health. <laughs> <laughs> Could be. <laughs> Try swimming. Okay, good. So, what was the physiological mechanism that you found? Was it increased blood flow, higher oxygen? Was it additional? Well, we think the cornerstone of the benefits is actually inducing BDNF and other related growth factors that I didn't talk about. And then, you know. That stimulates vessel growth. It stimulates neuron health and glial cell function. And so it's fundamentally gene expression for particular classes of growth factors. It's that simple, actually. Well, what I meant was what, what happened in the body when you exercise oh. that stimulated the growth? Well, very interesting. There's a, it turns out that the brain and the body work together. And so there is a peripheral component to it, which actually the muscles that are active send a signal to the brain to induce the growth factors and start to convert. There's also an effect directly in the brain itself on firing neurons better, and exercise actually sets up brain rhythms that are then translated into gene expression. So it's a partnership between the body and the brain. So I Uh, mild stress can, but it can't be long-term stress, you know, that is prolonged and, and severe. But it, exercise is actually a mild stress. But I think it's got other benefits because it's aerobic and it, it really does get the system going. Way in the back over there. Yeah, my uh, question kind of follows the guy up there. Um, the, do you have any thoughts on positive stress? Well, you know, some athletics are actually a positive stress. I mean, boy, you know, you go out for a tennis match or something and, you know, you're a little stressed out, you know, at least initially. And, you know, we see it in, in athletes like Serena Williams is famous for essentially being a little, getting, she has to get going before she gets so devastating. And so that's a little bit of stress involved and so on. But, you know, it's, it's hard to know about stress. It's a whole field in itself. And you know, be a good topic for a future uh, talk at a conference. Do we have one over here? Okay. Carl, one of the big problems that affects many people after 60 or so is depression. And it affects memory and cognition and everything. And I wonder if you took any steps to look into this, how, how that played out. Yeah, we did a few studies uh, ourselves, but then other people like Dumont and Yale have actually shown that exercise with particularly BDNF induction is antidepressant. I mean, exercise is known to be an antidepressant. Now, it's not going to take care of everything, but it sometimes deals with the medically resistant forms of depression and can be used synergistically with uh, some types of psychotropics. Can you see any improvements in the hippocampus with uh, these exercise programs? Yeah, believe it or not, uh, Kirk Erickson at Penn has actually shown that a one-year exercise program can actually increase the volume of the hippocampus and stop its rate of atrophy. 
It's so, remarkable. So then that should have an effect on Alzheimer's. Right, right. And that's what's basically shown in the, in the survey studies, but there's only one clinical trial to look at exercise in people with Alzheimer's disease, and that was only six months long, and basically it wasn't long enough to see whether there's a long-term impact. But I think it's even before Alzheimer's that you want to have the protection effect of exercise. Good question. Yes, in the stretching group, but uh, they don't seem to, at least in the published literature, have the same effect as aerobic exercise. But I wouldn't say that the bottom line is really complete yet on that. Um, I think my feeling is that a lot of these things need to be combined. You know, we're still in the single modality uh, research stage, and we need to look at exercise plus, you know, basically maybe coordination, stretch training, and other things that those things have embodied in them. Plus, we probably are gonna see a revolution in medications when they're combined with exercise, be and my one, guess. One more question back here. Uh, sir, I just had a question. I, I apologize if I missed it. What, uh, you said that mild uh, aerobic exercise had very little um, benefit. So, Well, you want to get your heart rate up, you know, to essentially 70%, uh, uh, you know, above baseline of heart rate reserve. And th three to four times per week at about 40 minutes is adequate and certainly easy. Now, I think once the person has actually got the benefits of exercise, I think it can probably be less dose intensive, but you know, with an occasional reminder dose, but that's speculation on my part. And maybe convenience thinking, because sometimes I have to do that. 